Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start the video two, which is of genetic technology, the A2 biology course 9700. And we further now elaborate on the different steps which are involved in uh, the production of a protein. And basically the production of the protein insulin is going to be discussed first. And then of course, we'll talk about the other proteins. Uh, this is an overview from your book, uh, which is used for the A2 biology course. So from the human pancreas, from the beta cells, we've taken out the mRNA. And then we have made a single stranded DNA. So and this is called cDNA. I'm going to be talking about this again a little more this in this video. And then we have used a DNA polymerase and we get a double stranded DNA. And then, of course, we've need uh, used restriction enzymes uh, to get sticky ends. Similarly, on the other side, we've taken bacteria, we've taken out the plasmids, we have used the same restriction enzyme, we've cut the plasmids from the bacteria, and now we have mixed the, the bacterial plasmid with the human, uh, you can see here what we are doing is, and we've used the ligase enzyme, and we've put together, now we've got recombinant DNA, and then we put this into a bacteria, and then we're going to identify the transformed bacteria somehow, how we do it. And then we're going to put all these bacteria into a fermenter and we're going to culture it. And then we're going to get our human, pure human insulin. And we're going to use this to be used for people who are suffering from diabetes. The reason why, because we have not been able to find a cure to get the pancreas uh, or the beta cells of the pancreas to produce insulin. So we failed. Technology has failed. We have not been able to jumpstart the beta cells or somehow make the beta cells produce insulin. But we found an alternative that we artificially make this insulin using uh, genetic technology. And then we, of course, sell this. Of course, this is a benefit to the pharmaceutical industry who makes uh, millions and millions of dollars and sells this. So produce insulin. And what we've done is previously before this, we used to use animal insulin. We used to use cow insulin or pig insulin. But now we don't because that used to have uh, religious issues and ethical issues and we would have to kill so many animals to get the cow insulin or the pig insulin. So which was very, uh, which was also re uh, resulted in allergic reactions to people. So what we are, what technology advancement came into force and we started to genetically engineer bacteria and the bacteria now produce insulin for us and that is used to treat uh, people and it's not used to treat I don't say it's a treatment because people who live for say 20 years with the diabetes they have to keep on injecting themselves with insulin so I'm I'm sad that it's not a cure but it's just uh, the pharmaceutical industry making a lot of money by selling this insulin so I wish somebody would work into it and think of finding a cure for diabetes rather than just making and just get to giving people crutches to work on, walk on instead of uh, instead of helping them to walk themselves. So diabetes, uh, insulin, production of insulin, genetic technology. We studied the AS level. We did not talk about this, but I want to start uh, discussing this now here at this point. Uh, in the eukaryotic cells, please understand these are eukaryotes. Why are they eukaryotes? Because they have a nucleus. So what we do is we, uh, normally what happens is that uh, transcription means DNA. And from the DNA, we make pre-mRNA. And from the pre-mRNA, then we make mRNA, the mature mRNA. So DNA to pre-mRNA and pre-mRNA to mRNA. Now this whole story takes place inside the nucleus. So if I took out this DNA and put it into a bacteria, I'm sorry, the bacteria is a prokaryote that cannot do RNA processing. I'm just going to explain this again. In a normal eukaryote, in a normal human cell, the DNA is first converted into a pre-mRNA and then it is Enzymes are needed to really actually cut off a bit of it and I'm going to explain it. Make mRNA and then this mRNA goes into the cytoplasm and attaches on the ribosome and translation takes place here and a polypeptide is made or a protein is made. 
and then of course there will be post translational modification go to the golgi add the glycogen part glycosylation and phosphorylation so normal eukaryotes what happens is dna to pre mrna pre mrna to mrna and the mrna then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm attaches to the ribosome and that is where translation is going to take place and a polypeptide is going to be made so if we put this dna in a bacteria this is not going to work so what we are going to do is we are going to get the mrna this one and we are going to use the enzyme reverse transcriptase and we are going to get a dna strand but this is not the original dna so this will be called c dna just bear with me a little and we go into little more explanations now look here we do a comparison between a eukaryote and a prokaryotic cell and it's a very good comparison you see here what happens dna transcription then rna processing and then translation but let's look what happens inside a bacteria bacteria is a prokaryote now in a bacteria there is no nucleus there is no nucleus so no rna processing can take place so from the dna of the this is the bacterial dna we have transcription and we have mrna and then this whole thing is in the cytoplasm because there is no nuclear membrane so dna to mrna mrna to polypeptide dna to mrna and mrna to a protein now it's a very good comparison to see prokaryotic and eukaryotic so there is not going to be any rna processing no rna processing takes place in bacteria while it can only take place in eukaryotes animal cells plant cells fungus cells so we can use yeast cells if we are going to be because that's a eukaryote if we are going to use that in genetic technology a good comparison for you to go through the points prokaryotic transcription coupled transcription translation is the rule occurs in the cytoplasm there is no definitive phase for its occurrence eukaryotes coupled transcription translation is not possible occurs in the nucleus take place in the g1 and the g2 phases so just a quick comparison for you to pause and have a look at it here comes an explanation of what i have been trying to tell you dna is made up of exons and introns what are introns introns are non coding regions and i usually say like if you open your bio book and we have page 50 and after page 50 you have uh, 10 empty white pages but nothing written on it and then you have page 51 so the 10 pages in between have nothing written on it but just empty pages so those are the introns so i call the introns the non coding regions now when the initial transcript is the pre mrna is made this is the pre mrna so the pre mrna copies the non coding region as well and what happens is that in a eukaryote in the nucleus you have enzymes which can do rna processing so the introns are removed and now what do we get we get the final mrna so the empty pages have been removed it's just like if you gave your book to be photocopied and the photocopier even copied the empty pages and then somebody would sit down and remove all the empty pages so introns and exons and then of course this mrna will go and enter the cytoplasm and that is where translation will take place another diagram for you to see there is a promoter which is just before the gene there is a promoter area which is recognized by the rna polymerase and promoter is also area where they are base pairing but it has a specific uh, distinct sequence of bases which only is recognized by rna polymerase so rna coding sequence we got this at the top then you see the pre mrna so the exons and introns all have been copied 
and then we see the mRNA and that is called RNA splicing. So there is an enzyme called spliceozyme and then we get the mRNA which is the final mRNA and that is going to enter the cytoplasm and then is going to be translated on the ribosome. Now you can understand why we call it cDNA. Why do we call it cDNA? Because it's not the original DNA because the introns, the original DNA had introns. So from the reverse, from the mRNA, using the enzyme reverse transcriptase, we get this DNA. And then we get a double-stranded DNA. And we call this the cDNA. Of course, the, the mRNA is degraded and it is removed. So synthesis of cDNA using reverse transcriptase. Please pause the video here and have a look at this. mRNA, and then the mRNA is sort of broken up, fragmented, degraded. We get a single-stranded DNA, then we get the double-stranded DNA using the enzyme DNA polymerase and this is the final cDNA because this cDNA is called copy DNA or complementary DNA. This does not contain any introns. The original DNA has a lot of introns. But because we have made this from the mRNA, that is why it will not have, this cDNA will not have any introns, so no introns. Now, we refer to this in the book many times as cDNA, but there's no explanation for it. And I want you to be understanding this, that why do we not just call it normal DNA? Why do we call it cDNA? The topic we need to talk about is how do we get the plasmids into bacterium? How do we get the recombinant DNA, the plasmid plus the gene of interest into the bacteria? We have to use some sort of method. And the first thing that we do is we provide it a very, uh, the bacteria treat it by putting them in a solution with a very high concentration of calcium ions. And then we give it a heat shock. And the heat shock is to increase the chances of the plasmids passing through the cell membrane. And this is called electroporation. Electroporation. Please understand the spelling of it. Poration, porating, pores. And this helps the plasmids passing through the cell membrane and entering the bacteria. But we are very unsuccessful at this. Why are we unsuccessful? We don't know why, but we are working on it. If only 1% of the bacteria take it up. So like for instance, if we had 100 million bacteria, only 1 million contain the gene of interest. And these ones are called the transformed ones. These are the transformed bacteria. Now, the trouble is that how do we identify them? There are 100 million bacteria and only 1 million have the gene of interest. So how do we identify those? Because we need to only culture those transformed ones so that we can then have the protein which they are going to produce. Like for instance, the bacteria that has the gene for insulin, will we only want to grow those? But out of the 100 million, there are only 1 million which have them. So first of all, we'll have to identify them and then we'll have to put them in a fermenter and then they will be making insulin for us. So this is how we have to, we are not very successful at getting the plasmids back into the bacterium and there's a new lot of bacteria which we take. And this 1% is a very, very uh, small number. So we have to understand is we need to put some sort of a marker along with it so that we can then tell, okay, this is the bacteria this contains this recombinant DNA which contains insulin because it has this marker on it and I can identify it somehow that okay this is the bacteria which is going to produce insulin for me and I need to now put these in the fermenter and grow them. Now initially we used to use a lot of antibiotic resistance genes along with the insulin gene but now uh, genetic engineers feel they should not be using it because if those plasmids uh, can somehow be transferred to other disease-causing bacteria, then we would get antibiotic, pathogenic antibiotic resistant bacteria. Like for instance, uh, tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria, cholera is caused by a bacteria. And if, God forbid, those resistant genes entered these pathogenic bacteria, then we would get those disease causing bacteria to be resistant to all the antibiotics. So genetic engineers now have stopped using the antibiotic resistance gene. Now what we use is we use enzymes which produce a fluorescent substance. 
Now, the enzymes which we have used, for example, enzymes obtained from jellyfish make a protein called GFP. Now, GFP stands for green fluorescent protein. Now, this green fluorescent protein fluoresces bright green and ultraviolet light. So, if we know that this bacteria contains the GFP and is making the GFP protein, then it will fluoresce. So, we can then identify that bacteria and separate it from the other 99 million bacteria which do not have the insulin gene. So, the gene for the enzyme is inserted into the plasmids. So all that needs to be done is to identify the bacteria that have taken up the plasmid is to shine ultraviolet light onto them. The ones that glow green are the genetically modified ones. Another marker is the enzyme beta glucuronidase which is also known as GUS. And this GUS, it originates from the E. coli and any transformed cell that contains this enzyme when incubated with some specific colorless or non-fluorescent substrate can transform them into colored or fluorescent products. So these are actually genetic markers which we have now started using so as to identify those bacteria because as I just told you out of 100 million bacteria only 1 million contain the insulin gene. So if we along with the insulin gene we have added a genetic marker as well with it which of course produces a fluorescent substance so then we can, when we shine ultraviolet light on it, we can easily identify that bacteria out of the millions. And then we can separate them. And then of course, put them in a fermenter and uh, provide it the nutrients. And it is going to divide by binary fission. And all the bacteria will contain the gene of interest, which is the gene for insulin. So basically why we use genetic markers is to identify the bacteria which contains uh, the gene that we have actually the gene of interest which is uh, being put in it so as to make the protein which is insulin because we need the insulin protein we don't need any other protein but we need the protein which is uh, required to treat some diseases so genetic markers now the next topic that we cover in uh, this uh, video is the polymerase chain reaction. Now, why do we need the polymerase chain reaction? Why we need the polymerase chain reaction? In other words, it's also called the PCR. Basically, the PCR is to amplify DNA. Like we've got DNA, we want to do some tests on it. So we want to make many, many copies of this. So amplification means making many, many copies of the DNA that we have. So we've got a certain uh, DNA, we can see this is the genomic DNA and the different steps are very simple. It's denaturation in which we heat briefly to separate the DNA strands. So denaturation. Then the second step is annealing. Annealing means that we add short segments of uh, complementary bases to the two ends. Now you see this is one strand, this is the other strand. And we've added this to this side and then we've added this to this side. <clears throat> so, so in the second stage, which is the annealing, we've added primers to form hydrogen bonds with the ends of the target sequence. Annealing. And then the third is either we say extension or we say elongation. Both are correct. So the first step is denaturation. The second step is annealing and the third step is extension or elongation. And what happens is that you've added more nucleotides and no more DNA polymerase adds, uh, adds the nucleotides to the three end of each primer. You know there's a five end and a three end. So this is the five end, this is the three end. So you've got to understand five, three and how this is we are adding it to the three end and then of course. So what we have to understand is we are adding it to the Sorry, we're adding it to the five end and then of course it is growing towards that side. So first step, denaturation, we heat it. Second, annealing. Third, extension. Now again, another diagram for you to see the different uh, temperatures. So the first stage is done at 94 degrees Celsius and then the second stage is done, the annealing is done at 54 degrees Celsius and then of course it is done at 72 degrees Celsius. So 
the different temperatures for the different stages, and of course, there's now it's done by a machine, so you don't have to do it manually. So a machine does this and copies of this DNA are made. Another diagram showing you the template DNA, of course, and then the denaturation, which we have separated the DNA, and then we've added the primers. Please remember DNA polymerase always works in the 5-3 direction. So primers bind to the template, and then we use an enzyme called TAC polymerase, and this was the first heat-stable DNA polymerase to be used in PCR. It was isolated from the thermophilic bacterium Thermus aquaticus, which is found in hot springs. Now, why is it important for us? Because what is going to happen? It's not going to be destroyed by the first step, which is the denaturation step. So it will not have to be replaced during each cycle. Second is high optimum temperature means that the temperature for the elongation step does not have to be dropped below that of the annealing process. So the efficiency is maximized. So TAC polymerase was a very good breakthrough in using that in PCR so that we did not need to, the enzyme, we did not need to change the enzyme every time. It was very thermostable and it was found actually in bacteria which were found in the hot springs. So PCR is used to amplify DNA and of course it's used in a number of uh, situations. Now the uses for PCR, as you can see here, is, uh, in medicine, we use it for detecting infectious organisms. Like, for instance, we do a test. We, we think this person is suffering from some disease. So we take a blood test and we some, somehow find that we find some DNA, which could be bacterial, which could be viral, which could be fungal. So if we just amplify that DNA and then we do tests on it, we can tell, okay, well, this person is suffering from a bacterial disease. So we give him antibiotics. But if it's a viral disease, we don't give him antibiotics. So detecting infectious organism, then discovering variations and mutations in genes, especially human genes, then the human genome project, DNA sequencing, then the law, genetic fingerprinting, we find um, some blood on the scene of a murder, and we take that uh, blood sample, we take some DNA and we amplify it, and then we figure out, okay, this DNA matches so-and-so's DNA. So in the law, we use it. Then evolutionary biology, DNA analysis for taxonomic classification, zoology, research on animal behavior, ecology, studies of seed dispersal, reducing the illegal trade in endangered species, and monitoring release of genetically engineered organisms, and of course, ancient DNA and analyzing genetic variation in animals and plants. So PCR is very, very, uh, I mean, of course, this is the most important thing in medicine is detecting infectious organisms, which has been a great breakthrough. And it has helped us to identify the pathogenic organisms which are causing the fever or the disease which the person is suffering from. And that, of course, helps us in then providing the appropriate treatment. So uses of PCR. The next topic is what is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics is what? Number one, mathematics, statistics, and computer. So bioinformatics has three basic MSc, maths, stats, and computers. So the mathematical, statistical, and computing methods that aim to solve biological problems using DNA and amino acid sequences and related information. So maths, stats, and computers. I'll combine all the three and we have a field of science which is called bioinformatics. Now, applications of bioinformatics has a major impact on many areas of biotechnology. Now, we've got to understand that because this contains all the data for the different amino acid sequences, of different proteins and it also contains data for the different DNA sequences of each and every organism, the human genome project. So knowledge based drug design or forensic DNA analysis or even agricultural biotechnology. So applications of bioinformatics is, 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 is in, in, intense. It's, it's very, very large for the field of bioinformatics to figure out a lot of fields in which it can be used. And then, of course, we can find treatments for a lot of things. We can improve crops. We can do drug designing. The aim of bioinformatics is organizing data in the correct manner. 
and you have these websites where you can actually pay and get to know the DNA sequences and the protein sequences. So organizing data in the correct manner, proper analysis of the data, and interpreting the data in a biologically meaningful manner. I mean, who does have a problem like sickle cell anemia? We have a different uh, sequence of the hemoglobin molecule. So how is that different from the normal hemoglobin molecule? Of course, all this data helps us in uh, diagnosis and, of course, then find, finally finding a treatment for it. Now, the goal of bioinformatics to uncover the wealth of biological information hidden in the mass of sequence, structure, literature, and biological data. Maybe it is used in the future for areas of molecular medicine. It has environmental benefits. We can identify waste and clean up bacteria. In agriculture, it can be used to produce high yield, low maintenance crops. So all these are different goals of bioinformatics, which of course helps us to improve the world at large. Now, internet and bioinformatics, internet plays an important role because we can retrieve the biological information. The new dimensions of biological science include computer, maths, and life science. And then of course, we've got all these software tools, we've got the database development, we've got the operating systems, and we've got the software and tools applications. So internet and bioinformatics is very closely linked and we have to talk about these and we have to, uh, you have to understand how we're going to use maths, stats, and computers to use this information which we have stored at different websites. This completes the uh, second video on genetic technology and then we will start with the next video which will cover the other topics which have been left out of this chapter. Thank you.